Animate, not okay, anime good. sharp, but very sharp. Okay. Uh, all right. I want to welcome Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife to the virtual couch. Uh, welcome, Jennifer. Yeah. Thank you for having me. No, I'm really, I really am grateful that uh, you're willing to take the time. And and I was going to jump right out of the gate. This is, you know, I know that I, I want your background. I want to get into a very solid interview, but I just had a client and I've been dropping your name for a little while. I'm not going to lie. If you would have had to cancel today, I would have just, I would have, you know, been racked with guilt and shame. Um, but, uh, the last client that left, they just said, you know, do you think that when people want to talk to her, because you specialize a lot in sexuality those, and, and yes. issues around sexuality, do you typically get the, Hey, so my friend wanted me to ask you, I mean, is that the way most conversations start with you? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, sometimes at parties, that's how it goes, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I, we don't have this my problem. My friend is having this issue. And what do you think about that? Right. Yeah, now, so. do you, do you know right away that it is their issue? Um, it, sometimes, but not always. Sometimes it is a friend, you know, sometimes some friend is going through something, but you know, sometimes you wonder if they're just, you know, trying to, uh, cover that they yes. have the question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I have to, I, I so want to just launch into my next question, but I, we need your background first because it will make more sense to the question I want to ask. So, uh, yeah. Jennifer, talk a little bit about your background. So I have um, a PhD in counseling psychology and, um, I studied at BYU, uh, Brigham Young University. I did my undergrad in psychology and women's studies. And then as a grad student, um, I was asked to teach an undergrad course on human sexuality. And that was at the same time that I was trying to figure out a dissertation topic. And, you know, it, I could spend a lot of time talking about how I came to my topic, but yeah. I decided to write my dissertation on Mormon women and sexuality and looking at Mormon women's sense of agency in their lives, um, both premaritally and within marriage. And so that yeah, was the a, focus yeah. of my research. Okay. You had a funny story about the teaching the classes too. I, I heard on one oh, of the yeah. podcasts. What was that? Yeah. So I was not yet married and I was asked to teach two courses. Uh, one was human sexuality and the other was drugs and alcohol. Okay. And here I was a Mormon who had no experience with either. <laughs> <laughs> and which one? So yeah, you and I, and I ended up saying no to the drugs and alcohol one and just did the sexuality one. But uh, yeah, okay. so it, you know, it opened up lots of questions. Look, I was teaching Catholic students because it was a Jesuit college. Okay. Colleges. So it was helping me sort of look at sexuality through the lens of Catholicism and then thinking about Mormonism as well as feminism, which I had studied a lot of. And so that led me to my topic, which okay, was a well, fascinating dissertation. Yeah, I bet. Well, and, okay. And, and I am kind of maybe going to go a little bit out of order because I have to tell you, as I was dropping your name, uh, so I had a, a woman who was sending me an email about one of the podcasts that she heard me on. And it was in particular about why is it so difficult to get men into counseling, which I'm sure we could talk about. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but she then said, uh, I, then I told her that you were coming on the podcast again, dropping the name yeah. all I could. And I actually wrote this. This was her exact quote. Um, she said, uh, she said, I love, and that's all in caps. So she was screaming this, Jennifer, um, her dissertation was fascinating. So I'm talking about your dissertation and yeah. she has a great question I want to get to in a little bit, but, um, sure. so I didn't realize, so you had worked with, uh, Catholics, you've worked as well as with Mormon because you're primarily focused with LDS women now. Is that? Yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so then my question, and I don't want you to think that everything I'm going to say is going to be a joke today, but I mean, I do find that I, so I do a lot of couples therapy and mm -hmm. I find that, you know, and I work with a, a pretty heavy LDS population as well. And kind of my joke is that with, with most couples, I see the sexual piece comes in usually in session one and the LDS couples, usually it's in session four or five and it's mm -hmm. uh, they're walking out the door and it's, by the way, have you ever mm -hmm. heard of, I mean, do you find that to be the case or when people know that's what you specialize in, do they come in ready? I mean, one thing I would say is that uh, many times it is men, I would say probably 50% of the time it's men reaching out for therapy mm. to me okay. for couples therapy okay. around sexual issues. Okay. So, you know, men do initiate counseling, but often sex is what gets them through the door. <laughs> I, well, I love that because that does make more sense. I mean, yeah. I'm usually getting, uh, women will initiate with me because I'm a male therapist. And so the, the guy will only go to a man therapist if I think that if she's saying, you know, you don't communicate. So I've never thought of that though. So for you, you have the specialty of, you know, working with sex issues around sexuality. Yes. So, so okay, the, well, we can go in a whole direction. So when men then come in, is it almost like, hey, uh, tell her, tell her she needs to have more, you know, more yes, sex with me. <laughs> yeah, that's often people's position. Would you please fix her? <laughs> yes. She is broken. Oh. And maybe you as a Mormon woman can enlighten her about how to 
claim her sexuality. Wow. I mean, there okay. is some legitimacy to that design sure. on his part, but oftentimes what it uh, masks or doesn't, isn't exposed yet within their own minds is their own participation in and role in the sexual dysfunction. Okay, so how do you how do you address that? I mean, this is I love that you're getting here because one of the things I hope to get to is is this view that I get where I have a you know a man coming in and letting me know in front of her that hey hey man you know I came into counseling male therapist now tell her that if we just had more sex I'm a better husband father employee church servant all of those yeah, things which right? is a very typical script which is Absolutely. basically do your duty and then I'll be a nicer guy right and so then that's the part where now I almost feel like it's okay I'll let him get through the speech and that sort of thing and then it's okay you know to the wife and and what's going on with you right now and then she feels like hey I yeah it's all on me right so if he is yeah, it's not, all on her yeah. and he's also setting up the marriage dynamic to be about mercy sex as opposed to intimate sex. I love it. Yes. Okay. Right. So he's setting up the very thing that he then complains about, which is she just does it mechanically. She just does it because, you know, she feels like she should, but where's all the passion. But when you set it up that sex is a drive or a need and you woman, if you're a good woman, well, give it to me. Yeah. You've now set up the thing that you then makes you miserable because you never feel wanted. Absolutely. Okay. And I apologize. I know this probably isn't the typical interview, but you know, I work, I work so much with them, that male component. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, at that point, then I kind of try to introduce the concept of, a, you know, objectification or at that point she feels like an object. Mm -hmm. And, and then, you know, and, and that's, yeah, like you say, that script is that if we only had more sex yeah. and then that I, I like the, I always feel like then the guy turns into it's if I am, if I am angry enough or if I am, you know, uh, I don't know, almost sad enough or, or down enough, then I will maybe get sex. Yeah. And, you know, now fast forward later on in couples therapy where that's not the person that she, you know, says that's the guy I want to be intimate with is the no, guy that has to write pity and guilt my way into it. And yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Very undesirable. Yeah. And yeah. then, and then he's scratching his head about why doesn't she desire me? <laughs> oh, okay. Right. And all right, you, you fix it. All right. What do you do with that, Jennifer? <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I guess what I would say is there's often at least two, maybe three things going on there. Um, first of all, it's often a co-construction. It's not just the man is pressuring this idea that if you take care of my sexual needs, I'll be a much nicer guy. Mm. And um, it's also that women, first of all, it's a cultural artifact. And so yeah. women have bought into this frame too. And when women... Um, who can often have a lot of anxiety about their sexuality, given the way that we um, shame sexuality culturally right? mm -hmm. and make it a difficult thing for women not uh, to integrate, men as well, but in a different way. And so it's often a way for women to not develop themselves as people and as sexual beings is to use the same frame that they're being handed, which is do me a favor and have sex with me. Okay. And so it's a way of not being intimate. It's a way of not being as exposed if you're just taking care of your husband, yeah. being that virtuous, self-sacrificing wife by putting up with his hedonism, you know? Yeah. Until so finally, yeah. 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 So it's a way for the woman to also hide. It's, it's a way for men and women to hide, which is just take care of me this way. She will give him the mercy sex, but no one really is showing up. It's not very intimate on either side. Yeah. So a lot of times both parties in a marriage want lower exposure marriages. They want lower exposure sex. And so couples are good at having sex without being very intimate. Yeah. Exposed. And this is a way to do it. Um, so um, I, I know that you asked me the question. And I said there's three things and now I can't remember what the question was. I can't either. So we're on the same page. It's fantastic. No, because then, and so then I, I just, I love that because that is the dynamic I, I, I see as well. And so um, I feel like a couple, so now here I'll lay out, I have three thoughts and I bet I'll only get to one as well. Right. So yeah. I, my first thought was um, that it's that uh, what I like to do is then if the, if the, if the woman felt like that wasn't all he cared about, you know, I mean, because I get this concept or maybe I wonder if you see this where, um, she doesn't want to hug him close. She doesn't want to kiss him. She doesn't want to lay in his lap while they're watching a movie because then he's sizing up the moment to say, okay, looks like I got a good shot tonight. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so then, and I find that then at some point then couples just, 
I had a woman say that she won't even look at her husband when they're at the dinner table because mm-hmm. she feels like she, I give many ideas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so, so, and then, Oh, I do remember my second one. So do you feel like this concept of intimacy then is when you're trying to kind of sell that to your clients, do you feel at times that they don't even know what that looks like? We're, we're trying to sell this idea that they don't even you know, they're, they're like, okay, sure, fine, but just tell her to have more sex with me. I mean, that's... that's well, you know. I, I think people often don't know what it looks like, but they do know what I mean when I'm talking about hiding and avoidance. Yeah, okay. Okay, so it's like maybe they haven't thought about it, but people do know how to manage how much of themselves they show to another mm. person. And they can usually see that they are masking or managing what of themselves shows up okay. in their relationship whether that's at the dinner table or in bed. So I think that, um, yeah, people are good at keeping relationships at the level that they know how to handle the level of exposure, even though they have maybe never experienced what it is to really have an open hearted, more um, intimate marriage. Okay. Uh, And so I want to kind of go back even to, well, okay, I do have to interject one more quick question too. I know on your website, you, you work on, I mean, you, you work with spirituality, women's issues, parenting, uh, depression, um, couples issues. Do you feel it, what's the percentage of your work that is around sexual issues? I mean, is that the bulk of it? It is. I mean, I put all that on my website kind of when I first started, you know, ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> and I yeah. mean, I do deal with all those issues. It's absolutely no question. Yeah. I would say, you know, relationship uh, issues and sexuality issues is really primarily what my focus is. Okay. But it touches on all those things. Sure. I okay. mean, you know, going back to, I think the question you asked me earlier, when that couple comes in and they're yeah. he's complaining about that. I mean, what my strategy is often is that is, is to basically understand why she doesn't desire. I'm going to do it in the stereotypical way right okay. now, which is the sure. low desire woman and the higher desire man. And so why does she not desire him? And, and oftentimes there, there's two things, two broad categories to think about. One is the issue of her self and sexual development. Yeah. Okay. That's also true for the men. I just specialize a lot in working with Mormon women and their own uh, relationship to desire, to sexuality, to self-development, because I think culturally we are pretty compromising of women in mm. this way. And so that's often a factor is that women in their effort to be good women, desirable women have sort of suppressed a fundamental part of being a woman and a fundamental part of being human. So that's sometimes a factor. You have people that are sexually immature and it sounds insulting when I say it that way, but I mean it in a literal developmental sense that there isn't a deep integration of their sexuality that's happened yet. So that's often a piece that's going on. And then there is the issue of what's going on in the relationship. Now, some people who haven't developed themselves sexually very much and don't want to, yeah. they can do things in the relationship to basically shame his sexuality, to basically never offer him desire, to never really validate who he is as a person as a way of keeping control, keeping him coming towards her for validation mm. and her having a sense of control in the marriage so she doesn't have to really develop who she is sure oh, do you feel like that's typically subconscious not something that she's even aware she's doing well i hesitate to use the word subconscious because i, I it's not just happening to you yeah okay? it's purposeful action but that's very different than saying it's premeditated sure okay you see what i'm saying yeah so yeah it's purposeful you, you know how to do it you know for example in one case like she's doing what her mother did. Her mother would never offer her dad acceptance, love, physical validation. The mother ran the family yeah. out of her kind of contempt and, and um, judgment. Okay. And then the daughter, who's now an adult, did this, has done the same thing in the marriage. Okay. So the husband's always sort of feeling that he's ostracized, that he can't ever get her approval or acceptance, but she gives enough to kind of keep him tethered to okay. her. Yeah. So, so that's one version of it. In other cases, you know, there's the man who is like, you owe it to me. I'm the man. I mm. do everything. Uh, you know, what's your problem? 
Yeah. And so she will kind of manage him through being sexual, trying to keep his criticism and his anger and aggression at bay. Okay. But it's not about desire. It's about manage. So she may even be sexual quite a bit, but that's very different than she's really someone who is integrated with her sexuality and is really expressing love to him through her body. Okay. It's very different. Well, so I'm, I'm usually looking at both the level of sexual development in both people Okay. And how integrated they are with their sexuality. And then I'm looking at what is the dynamic of this marriage and, and what is happening that sexual desire is not likely here. Okay. And so, and I do want to tap into what your, your expertise is. So in that moment, do you continue doing couples work or is that where you need to kind of step back and explore with the, the woman, her, her relationship with sexuality? I, I usually just keep doing couples work, even if she's working on some of these things, um, you know, within the context of couples work. Sometimes I'll do individual sessions and oftentimes I'll have people do my online course for LDS. Okay. Right? Yeah. We never yes. heard a lot about that. The, um, the, the art of desire. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so that really, but, but so much of the work of sexual development, which is also in this course is around your relationship to your own sense of self, your relationship to desire in your life generally, your development as a person to who is capable of really loving and being loved, is capable of really knowing and being known. Okay. And how your development of sexuality is integral to that process of becoming a whole woman, a whole person. Yeah. So it is teaching women about women's sexuality, which is an amazing Women's sexuality is amazing, really. I mean, I think our culture does it short shrift in, in a crazy way because yeah. we reference male sexuality to understand female sexuality. Uh -huh. And so we, female sexuality looks broken by comparison because it's different than men's sexuality. But so part of the course is helping women, and part of the work I do with women is helping them understand what women's sexuality is really about. But my, the course is not so much about helping women become sexually competent so that they can, you know, help their poor right. husband, yeah. right? It's really about how to be more integrated with yourself, to be more of a whole solid human being who can be a force for good in your life, in your marriage, with your children, you know, in whatever capacity. And that is fundamental aspect of that is being integrated with your desires and your sexual nature. So where do you, do you mind kind of stepping back and then take sure. the, the LDS woman and maybe from the time, I mean, can you kind of work that through linear from the time they are young? This is the story we hear. And so here's where, is it the shame or the guilt that kind of drives the narrative? And then all of a sudden now we're married and hey, there you go. You know, and then, so yeah. Yes. I think for both LDS men and women, there is a yeah. narrative that sex is Satan's pathway mm. and that sex will take you down. And so there's a, there's a deep anxiety, and this is not just, just specific to Mormonism. I mean, okay. cultural anxiety around sexuality for a good reason, which is because sexuality is a very intimate and powerful way to be in connection with other people. Yeah. But oftentimes the way that anxiety around sexuality gets handled, and particularly because in our faith we have a, you know, a, a fairly restrictive set of norms around how we should handle our sexuality, Mm -hmm. And so sometimes how we, how we teach that, given that we have high expectations around sexual behavior, is to frighten people around their sexuality. Sure. Okay? Okay. It's fear-based teaching rather than goal-based teaching. And so when you're fear-based, then there is this anxiety that sex will take you down. Sex will turn you into a bad person. You know, sex will distance you from God and from the people that you love. And what we do, we teach men and women, both, that both men and women get taught that idea. But I think the difference between men and women is that we teach women that sex is something, sexuality, sorry, men are naturally sexual, women are not. That's, the, that's what we teach, or that's the narrative. That's, that's okay. the narrative. That's the message within the message, is that women are sexual only to accommodate and mm. manage the sexuality and sexual nature of men. Okay. So men are naturally sexual. And so women should therefore, you know, dress modestly, you know, cover their bodies up because men's sexuality is present and normal for being mm. a man. But if you tempt them, that not only is it dangerous for you, it's dangerous for them. Yeah. So we, it, they're implicit in that idea is that 
sex is something you give a man. Virginity is something you give a man, but men are the sexual actors. Okay. Women are in response to this. So many Mormon women that I work with, what they do is they, because they, they see sexuality as something that makes you bad and particularly so for women. For example, many of the women I re, that I... Uh oh, my first ever frozen podcast. Um, I'm going to hang on here for a second and hopefully Jennifer will come right back. Um, this is a first on the virtual couch. Uh, if she doesn't bounce back. I will pause the video. Let me pause that right now. Okay, we're back. Go, can you hear me? Oh. There, sorry about that. Okay. I lost internet. That was my, my problem. No problem. The, the kids were playing Fortnite. Is that what it was? No, <laughs> no. My husband thought I was on the, on the big computer. And so he oh. did something with the Wi-Fi network, not knowing that I was on my laptop. Oh, so anyway, okay. I'm so glad you're back. No, that was so, that, okay. Good. All right. We were, you, you were remember just, what I was just saying? You were about to solve everyone's problems around sexuality <laughs> in the entire world. You're about to give this. Exactly. No, so it was, it was kind of talking about that um, where women are, you were talking about how they give, they give the sexuality, they give their virginity. That, that oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So I think what I was saying was, I'll just start. So I think, you know, for example, women in my research felt um, more guilty if they had engaged in some, you know, behavior premaritally mm. than meaning they thought it was more acceptable if a man had done the same thing. And so that is the idea that women are worse if they are sexual. So what okay. many women in my research and in my office clinically have done is they just shut this whole enterprise down. Like if this is going to make me undesirable, which is an idea that we teach, and if this is going to make Satan have some grip on me, I just won't develop this at all. Uh -huh. I'll wait till I get married, and then my husband will awake this, awaken this whole part of me, okay. and he will teach me about how to be sexual because men are naturally sexual. And so what happens, oh, wow. of course, is people get married, and then they're waiting in a sort of passive stance for something to be awoken within them, and it never works that way. Right. Okay. So what's your, then what's your advice? I mean, and it is funny, the, the one I was telling the, this, uh, she's, she wants to become, she wants to be the next you, the student that was emailing me this morning, uh, wants to be a LDS female sex therapist, um, which I, I love mm -hmm. that. And so, you know, I, she talked about, or the question was around, um, how, how do LDS women prepare for their sexual lives and marriage? And she said, because I have so many friends that have gotten married, struggled in their sex lives because they either felt bad about having sex or they didn't know their body as well. So, yeah, so, so I think, I mean, I think we have to really reconsider how we teach men, young men and young women in the church or okay. even at an earlier age, how we teach our children about sexuality. Because if we do it in the frame that sex is inherently dangerous and bad, you are going to have all the problems you see in adulthood in the church now, which is issues with pornography and yeah. issues with sexual repression. Okay. Because we, we, what we need to do is to talk to boys and girls and men and women about sex as though sexuality is a fundamental part of being human. It's God given Yeah. that our parents in heaven are embodied just as we are and that sexuality is not good or bad. It just is. It's just fundamental to being embodied. Mm. What you do with your sexuality will determine whether or not sex is good or bad. Okay. What you do with your sexuality matters because what your choices have make a difference. They impact both you and they impact others, whether those are choices of indulgent behavior or repressive behavior. Okay. Right? Repressing your sexuality is bad for your psychological and sexual and spiritual development, in my opinion. Because that leads pure, to pure yeah. repression is okay. Pure repression is because you're basically suppressing a fundamental part of being embodied, and we in our faith believe that embodiment is fundamental to our spiritual development. Yeah, if you're really going to love and be loved deeply in marriage, which is the gift of marriage, right? Yes, yes. You have to be able to really be integrated with your body, mm. meaning to to be, to love and be loved, and to be able to love through your whole body. That's probably like the, the, the most wonderful part of life 
is to be fully accepted by what someone and to be fully accepting of them. But if you can't really be at peace with your whole body, your sexuality included, you cannot know that kind of peace both with yourself or with another person. Mm. And so we are teaching sexuality in a way that makes it impossible to be at peace because we teach men also that sexuality is fundamental to being male or masculine, but that it's dangerous, you know, that it's, it's something that will take you down and it's, it's a privilege on some level. It's a privilege of, of marriage. We teach men that idea. So that's why you get a lot of entitlement in men once they get married, but also it's something that you do to a woman. Okay. Right. It's not yeah. something that you really share. That it's about how can we be together and be sexual and enjoy each other. It's and so when you have it in the frame of it's something you do to another person, well, it fosters either entitlement or in men it can foster a sense of anxiety because at least more sensitive men don't want to be inflicting their sexuality onto their spouse all the time. Sure. And so a lot of times it creates more anxiety and fear around sexuality for many men. So what, what's your, when you talk about we need to do a better job younger in teaching that, how, what does that yeah. look like? In the... Well, I, I think you need to from the very, first of all, you have to deal with your anxieties about sexuality as a ah. person and as a parent because your anxieties, your kids will track them and pick up on them whether or not you want them to. Sure. And so you, it's going to include doing some work around the false traditions or messages that you've internalized around sexuality. But I think what it is, is a basic embracing and celebration of the body from a very young age hmm. so that you're not, you know, afraid of your child's nudity. Yeah. You're okay. not showing so there's not that shame or I can't believe you're, you know, go get something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times kids are going to touch themselves when they're very young and be exploring their bodies. This is a hundred percent normal Yeah. You know, because your child is just trying to understand where they end and the world begins. They want to kind of know who they are. And of course, areas of their body that give them pleasure are going to be interesting to them. And yeah. that does not mean they're soon to be a pervert. It just means they're human. Okay. Oh, and yeah. so to be very normalizing of this is very important because you're giving your child a message that the body is good. And uh, well, I like your, I like your concept too, around dealing with our own issues. I mean, because I, you know, I went and spoke to a school recently of how to talk to your kids about sex. And I felt like there were a lot of people there that were just so you could see the just, yeah you know, anxiety and, and nervousness on their yes. face. And, and it was like, okay, we're coming here. We got to just, we're, we're got to get like serious and angry and battle yeah. ready. And yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Exactly. So I think yeah, absolutely. We, we have a hard time seeing our children as sexual beings or accepting that they are. Mm. Uh, if we want to control them, if we're afraid of what they might do with their sexuality. And so many of us almost instinctively want to shame it out of them. Yeah, But I promise you, you will create many more troubles for them and you if you do that to your children. Because yeah. when it's put in a frame of shame, you, you inhibit your child from being able to integrate this with their sense of self and be able to make clear-headed choices with their sexuality. Okay. For example, the more women were shamed, there's some research on the, and the less educated they were about their sexuality as adolescents, the more likely they were to have sex. And not good sex, right? Sex where they felt exploited, sex where they felt, you know, taken off guard, sex where they were more likely to get pregnant because they, they had no opportunity to kind of integrate it enough with their sense of self to be able to proactively make decisions. So and that's, I think that is the, 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 the biggest takeaway is the, so the more it is shamed, the more it's repressed, the more guilt that is around it, then the more, are you saying then the more active that someone is or, or. Uh, they have an unhealthy relationship with sex. Yeah, the more unhealthy their, their, their relationship to sexuality is, whether it's through indulgence, if you want to use that word, or through repression. Okay. So it's like you, you know, it's a little bit like, and sometimes I use a food metaphor, which is if you basically, you know, the, the desire to have food is normal. Yeah. The desire to have sugar is even normal because from a um, survival um, perspective, Sugar is the surefire way for the body to get the calories it needs to yeah. stay alive. Quick energy, right? Okay. Right. But if you tell people that, you know, if you tell someone that eating sugar is bad, even wanting it is bad, if you want brownies, it means you're bad. What you are going to do is either create an anorexic or a bulimic. 
You're going to okay. either create someone who just says, I will, I will not get, let myself have any pleasure. Okay. Or you have someone who's trying to not want it, but become obsessed with it because it's not allowed. And so they will be excessive. Either position is bad for the psychological and, you know, physical development of a human being in, in the food metaphor. So okay. first of all, I love brownies, but then you also were going to that, that that's what I was, I loved in one of the podcasts, you talked about the, the, the candy store analogy. I mean, with, with regard to pornography and sexuality, do you mind sharing that? Sure. And I, and I don't know if I exactly remember how I talked about that's that, okay. but I think, but I think the idea is basically it's normal for adolescents to be drawn, to be curious about sexuality, to be curious about um, nudity. Mm. You know, I sometimes tell the story like my dad had a book on his top of his bookshelf called The Naked Communist. Oh, wow. And, and, <laughs> and The Naked Communist is a Leon Skousen book. It, it's like it's it's like a political philosophy. Book yes. And nothing about nudity. Yeah. But I scaled my father's bookshelf <laughs> to get that book and was disappointed to see there were no naked communists in it. Okay. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's normal behavior. I mean, yes. you know, you're curious, you're trying to understand sexuality. So if you shame that, okay, if you say that the fact that you have sexual feelings or you're curious or you want to see a naked woman or whatever, that there's something wrong with you, first of all, you're being dishonest with your mm. child yeah. and you're shaming something that's normal and necessary for becoming capable of sexual intimacy in an integrated way down the road. Yeah. So you want to normalize it because and I think the candy store metaphor I used is, you know, like porn is everywhere. Okay. It's just, it just. Pornographic images are everywhere. It's the culture that we live in. If you make it forbidden, you increase its desirability. Yes. Yeah. And so I can't remember how I referenced the candy store exactly, but I think what I'm saying is the same idea that if you basically say you can't have it, you can't have it, you're going to forge an obsession with eating candy. Yes. You know, I had a client who, not a client, a friend who um, would throw herself in front of the magazine racks in the grocery store line so that her kids who were three and five would not see the bare, you know, or the low cut dresses and the bikinis and so on of the women in the magazine. And because she was so terrified of her kids becoming porn addicts. Yeah. And I said to her, you are making, you are turning them into porn addicts because you are, you are meshing both fear and the forbidden together. Yeah. Okay. Right. And so it's like this anxiety and then this curiosity and what is mom so afraid of? It just, it like drives a kind of obsessiveness rather than, eh, yeah, it's normal. You know, people sell stuff. You know, if they try to sell stuff by showing more of their bodies, like, isn't that silly? Okay. And, and yes. And just kind of normal, allow your kids to make sense of it, allow them to see that you're not terrified of it, that you yourself are comfortable with a better version of sexuality than that kind of uh, objectifying or commodifying of sexuality. Yeah. And so, you know, you're, you're role modeling a kind of moderation and clarity that is really needed to navigate through a very sexualized world. And, and then one of my big soapboxes, and I love you tied in there, is I, I say that uh, I, parents always say, you can come and talk to me about anything. But then if you come and say, hey, how about that sex? And then they're like, we don't talk about that. You know? And so now, <laughs> yeah. now the, the teen or the youth, is, they, have to, they know now I need to control the flow of information. Which, yes, definitely. And, right? And so okay, kids are always tracking, can yeah. my parents really handle this conversation? Yeah. So I want that. I want that conversation about, hey, so I, you know, and I remember when we had the talk with uh, our kids, my oldest after, you know, when I proudest dad moment as she circles back around at a store a few days after we yeah. had the talk. And then, you know, she sees the, the whatever, the, the magazine and there's a teenage girl and she's uh, some star and she's pregnant. And my daughter saying, you know, she's like, you know, before I thought, I, I don't understand. She's not married, you know, and she's right. pregnant. How does that work? And I just love the fact that then she, we, we talked about it then. Right. Or exactly. I don't want that, you know, she's trying to figure out the world and she's like, I can't ask mom or dad because right. they lip, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And when they see that you can really handle it and that you, you know things, you know, mm -hmm. um, they will use you as a resource. They really will. And then there is also a certain point, you know, <laughs> 
you know, my 15 year old, I was talking to my husband in front of my 15 year old the other day. And I, I was saying something like, you know, someone wrote an email and they were asking, you know, how do you talk to your kids about masturbation? And my 15 year old was there and he's like, you don't. Ah. <laughs> okay. it's kind of funny. <laughs> I mean, there's a certain point at which they no longer want you talking to them. And so, you know, the prime age to really download information and your values and so on is about age eight to about age 12. Perfect. Okay. And, you know, the, you know, it's not that you can't still right. mentor or talk about or be aware, but they're less open as they get older. I love that. I, this was going to be my last question, but I've got another one that I want to ask after this one. But I was going to say with the three kids, um, you know, as a therapist myself, and we all share a, a cloud, Kindle cloud, and I think they see all the, you know, pornography addiction, recovery, that sort of yeah. thing. So any family night, I almost feel like they're all ready to say, are we talking pornography again tonight? You know, and <laughs> And uh, like, no, 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 we're okay. Yeah. You know, but since you mentioned it, you know, yeah. uh, and yeah. then Leo, it's like, what have you seen? What's the last thing you saw? Um, mm -hmm. So I do, I, and I don't know if this one's going to be too ambiguous of a question, but so what I do see a lot, and I'm just curious what your thoughts are, you know, when there are some women who have, they have been, it was never talked about when in their home and, and it was probably heavily guilted and shamed. And so then they get in a marriage and it's, you know, so the, just the, the husband, I work with a lot of men and sometimes it is because now they turn to addiction, they turn to pornography um, as a coping mechanism or a whatever, that, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. But it's mm -hmm. because they just, they're, they're, they feel like their wife just has zero interest in sexuality and to the point where she doesn't even want to talk about it. Right. And so right. do you have some thoughts on that? I mean, I think that is, can be true that people who have a lot of it, and, and I would say both the man and the woman in this example have anxiety about sexuality. It's Absolutely. just getting handled in different ways. Yeah. And yeah, what, what advice? I guess what I would say is that, yeah. I mean, one of my big messages is trying to just normalize I don't even normalize is quite the right word. The just even talk that, about it, I wonder. You know? Exactly. This sexuality is so fundamental to being human and so fundamental to having a good marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that's different about marriage than any other relationship is it's both chosen and that it is a sexual contract. And that's not me saying you have to have sex with your spouse. I'm saying that the understanding, in unless there's some explicit other agreement, is that when you get married, that there's this idea that we are bringing our sexuality to one another. Uh -huh. And then what happens is because this is higher anxiety or there's things that are not working or there's things that are being exposed through the, the sexual relationship or the lack of it that are, is overwhelming for the couple, that oftentimes they will handle it by not handling it. Yeah. They will just try to distance from it. And so, uh, and then what often can happen for the man in this particular kind of scenario is that he feels like if I bring it up, she gets really upset. She gets yeah. really distressed. I just better stop bringing it up. And she maybe thinks, well, he's not bringing it up. So maybe we're right. good. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Or he brings it up and she says, this is all you ever think about. Yes. You know, why are you such a natural man? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, really um, being willing to address and deal with how corrosive it is in the marriage that the sexual sexual relationship is not really being dealt with. Sometimes it's about the woman's repression, but sometimes she's also getting really bad sex. I mean, sure. she doesn't necessarily understand enough what she wants to know how to ask for better sex. Sometimes she does know what she wants, but her husband is not that interested in learning about her or knowing what to, or willing to really give her what she wants. Um, you know, many couples kind of co-construct the sexually broken woman because the man prefers that idea. Yeah. That, you know, in, in a sense, I know it sounds strange, but he prefers that you're broken and you just sort of accommodate me than that she could really access her sexual sure. capacity and interest, right? Yeah. So, you know, for people to really address why, why does sex not work for us? You know, I asked somebody today, why do you think your wife doesn't desire you? How do you make sense of that? And, you know, I had been giving him lots of data about how he's not trustworthy, how he does self-serve so much in the marriage, how he basically mind twists her around things. Okay. He doesn't, he's sort of acknowledging I'm right about that, but doesn't really want to acknowledge the one I said, you know, how do you make sense of it? 
he spent all of his energy talking about how she's broken, uh, not about how he functions like somebody that a woman with good judgment would not desire. Okay. Right. So it's often very hard. We want to just say, what's the matter with you that you don't want me, you loser, yeah. Yeah. rather than how do I make it hard for someone to want to really be close to me, open up to me, bear her soul to me. A lot of times we don't want to deal with who we really are. Mm, okay. I love that I mean, because that, and you do a lot of couples work. I do a lot, an awful lot of couples work and that really does boil down to that empathy and awareness and understanding and I need to take my fixing and judgment hat off and yeah. I need to understand where my partner's coming from and that's more important to me than can't we just have more sex? Yes, right. Right, yeah. right exactly. And kind of, you know, because what's often happening in couples is the meanings that are happening around their marriage and their sexual relationship is what's killing desire. Mm. You know, he doesn't yeah. even notice if I'm here, meaning, okay, maybe I don't want to touch him or hug him because then he'll take it as a signal that I want to have sex. But what she's also saying is, I don't want to touch him and hug him because he, how to say it, mm. he will bulldoze then. He doesn't track or he, he refuses, he does track, but he f- refuses to acknowledge that I'm not continuing to give signals yeah. right, that I want it. So yeah. he takes it as like, uh-huh. okay, I've gotten the bit of data that I can now yeah. justify myself. Oh, yeah, now we're yeah. on, right? Now we're on, I can justify myself and she knows he doesn't even care that I'm not here. Right, okay. Uh-huh. And we want that, that's not being present, that's like, uh, you know, yeah, okay. Yeah, and maybe a little bit darker version of it is, it's, it's that I don't care if you're here, I feel entitled yeah, to sex and I'm gonna have it with yeah. you. And yeah. I can use the fact that you made eyes at me at dinner to justify moving forward or going blind to the fact that you are not present and don't want it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Hey, any other kind of final thoughts? Uh, I mean, there's a couple other, I feel like I got a couple other deep dive topics. Maybe I could uh, touch base with you again uh, down the road. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah, No problem. Yeah. I don't know if I have other thoughts other than um, I think what I maybe would say is that working out what's not working in your sexual relationship is um, fundamental to developing as people and to mm-hmm. developing into people more capable of love and spirituality. Yes. So one of the things that's really amazing about our theology is that we really do believe that the body is fundamental to our spiritual development. But then around sex, we sort of forget that idea. Yeah. Rather than really confronting who you are as a person, who you are in your own development, who you are in your relationship, is really fundamental to becoming someone more capable of really loving and caring for another person and being cared for. And and I like what you said earlier, if you can't tap into that, then how do we expect to have this ultimately connected marriage and relationship and a different view of intimacy and and living happily ever after, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, So what what are the the courses that you recommend? You have some nice online programs, I think that would be great. Sure. So I have the one I referenced, The Art of Desire, which is a, a course for, um, sexual, for women's self and sexual development, LDS women's self and sexual development. Then I have two couples courses. One is called Strengthening Your Relationship, which really helps you look at the dynamics of your relationship, what's happening, and how you can develop skills and capacities to, to forge a better relationship. And then I have a couple's sexual intimacy course. It's called Enhancing Sexual Intimacy. And I really help people to understand the way I think about sexuality, the way I think about sexual development, and then what's happening in this partnership that sexual desire breaks down or sexual connection breaks down and how you can create something deeper, more meaningful, and more inclusive of the female because many of us are trying to operate under a very male model. Yeah. Um, and then I do a how to talk to your LDS kids about sex course. I love and that. I didn't, I wasn't aware of that when I was looking yeah. on your website. That's a, that, yeah. that's a good one. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I'm really trying to help parents teach their children sexual integrity and mm-hmm. by that an integration of their body, but also an integration with their morality and what it is they want to create through their sexuality and okay. through sexual um, decision-making, you know, that is to say what you don't do is as much as important as what you do choose around your sexuality to forge the kind of um, ability to be in an intimate relationship down the road. Okay. Hey, mm-hmm. I, I really enjoyed this. I really appreciate yeah. you taking the time. Um, sure, my pleasure. Yeah. yeah, this was fantastic. Great. So uh, hopefully we can catch up again down the road. And Great. your website is? 
uh, just my name, finlaysonfife.com, hyphen in between. So finlaysonfife.com. Perfect. All right. Uh, yeah. And I will, uh, I will put links in the show notes. And Jennifer, I'm really grateful for your time. I am. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have a chance to talk again. Okay, good. Thanks, Tony. Okay. No, thank you so much.